Tonight's episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show is brought to you by Kid Products, stick stoves and reflector ovens proudly made in Canada. Algonquin Outfitters, with five key locations in and around Algonquin Park to serve your backcountry needs. Salus Marine, keeping you safe on the water since 1999. Ostrom Outdoors, custom fit canoe packs and barrel harnesses. Badger Paddles, handcrafted canoe paddles made to order. And Novicraft Canoes, connecting you with nature in Canadian-made canoes since 1970. Well, happy Tuesday evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Canoe Hound's Outdoor Adventure Show. My name is Dennis, also known as Canoe Hound, and if this is your first time tuning into the show, thank you very much. Uh, we are live here every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., and uh, you know what? If you happen to miss this episode or any other of our past episodes, you can always feel free to check them out in our past episodes playlist. Uh, the show is also available after airing here on uh, YouTube Music as a podcast. So you can even listen in your vehicle when you're driving to work or, uh, you know, heading somewhere, you know, dropping the kids off. Uh, maybe the kids are playing hockey, whatever it might be. But yeah, by all means, do check us out on uh, YouTube Music as well. Uh, we do have a little bit of news and updates here because it's been a couple of weeks here uh, since our last episode. And speaking of which, our last episode uh, featured Xander and Maxim Budnick. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Budnick boys, a couple of adventure bros, and uh, a couple of really good YouTubers are uh, pumping out some really cool content these days. Uh, the show was basically geared at a little bit more about what they have done in the past, uh, maybe pre uh pre-YouTube or what got him into doing YouTube and some of their, their earlier trips as a, a couple of uh, young Budniks, right? So uh, if you happen to miss that show, it was a really good show. Uh, we got a little bit of a sneak peek as to the most recent video that Xander just put out and one that uh, Max is going to be putting out and it's uh, all worth, uh, really worth checking out. So go on back, check it out if you, uh, if you missed it and uh, you won't be sorry that you did. Uh, next week, we got a really cool show coming up. Uh, we're going to be uh, joined by a few uh, really cool adventurers. Uh, Jim Baird, uh, Keenan and Ashley from Canoe of the North. Uh, Karts, I always mess up this guy's last name, but uh, Art Karts Hasconia. And, uh, of course, Mark from uh, Up North Adventures. And we're going to be talking about uh, the allure of paddling in the Yukon. Uh, usually when I'm doing shows like this here, it's usually for a reason. It's because I'm doing my research. I'm planning my own trip, uh, hopefully in the future. I'm uh, really hoping that maybe next summer, not this summer, but next summer, uh, a Yukon trip might be in the uh, works. So let's see what happens there. But anyway, it's going to be a great show next week. Uh, we're going to find out why so many people are flocking to the Yukon, you know, driving from Ontario, uh, such a long distance to uh, to get up there, or from anywhere for that matter, not just Ontario, but uh, well worth uh, checking out for sure. Uh, let's see here. Time to uh, maybe acknowledge a few of my uh, my channel members and uh, some, uh, some, some of those of you that are actually celebrating milestones with uh, your channel memberships. Uh, we got uh, celebrating 36 months, man. Three years that you've been a channel supporter. Thank you very much to Donald Dakota and Jay's Way. Uh, 36 big months. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, also, uh, at 24 months, uh, birthday boy from a couple weeks ago, Joe Burley. Uh, thanks very much for your support at 24 months. And then at 12 months, we have uh, Evan LaFave. Evan LaFave is already 12 months for you, Evan. I, I know you're in the chat there. So thanks very much for your support, man. It, uh, it, it's greatly supported or greatly appreciated. Um, all my channel members, of course, are floating across the bottom of the screen here. And actually, one of our guests, uh, Nate Muskoka, 
it says he in, in my in my records it says that he's actually been a supporter for 12 months but this is his second go around under a new account and he's been with me for well over three years too so thanks to nate and i'll thank him personally in a few minutes when he's up here on screen with us uh also my buy me a coffee uh supporters uh beauty of the back country thanks very much for your coffee contribution let's take a dip everybody Kevin, I see you in the basement there. You didn't take a dip with us. <laughs> out, out comes this cup. Okay, anyways, uh, you know what? Um, just got a few birthday wishes as well. Now, last week, I, I missed the show because I was in Canucopia and I didn't have enough time to prepare. I got home late later on Monday and was just so exhausted from a, a, an incredible weekend. But uh, that's why we're back this week. But so a couple of the birthday wishes are for people that uh, actually celebrated last week, uh, and I missed their wishes. But uh, I understand David North uh, from the YouTube channel North is uh, celebrating a birthday or has just celebrated a birthday. A uh, longtime follower, Mark Pinard, he, it was his birthday yesterday. Uh, Maxim Budnick, our, one of our guests from a couple of weeks ago here, uh, he's celebrating a birthday tomorrow. Uh, better late than never. Uh, Noah Booth from the Northern Scavengers uh, celebrated his birthday last week when we were off air. So uh, happy birthday to you too, Noah. And if anybody has a uh, birthday wish or something that they'd like us to share here on the show, uh, the intro here, please just drop me an email here at uh, canoehound at gmail.com. I would be more than happy to uh, to spread the love with everybody. And you know what? It's always cool to see them birthday cakes in the chat, which I'm not seeing any right now, but it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see here. Also, if you have any topics or I uh, guess that you'd like to see on the show, please do drop drop me an email here as well. Let's uh, let's make some cool shows happening. I'm just trying to fill the remainder of uh, this fifth season of ours, which uh, ends uh, sometime in May. Uh, we do have some great shows coming down the pipe, so uh, just stay tuned to our Facebook page at uh, Canoe House Outdoor Adventure Show for that there to know exactly what's going on with all of our uh, upcoming shows. Anyways, uh, tonight we got a great uh, a great lineup of uh, panelists here, and we're going to be talking about the topic of uh, ice out or, or spring backcountry trip planning, whether it's uh, by canoe or by foot, if you're a hiker or whatever it might be. Uh, we're going to share all kinds of tips and information. And uh, hopefully everybody leaves this show tonight feeling a little safer and a little bit warmer when they uh, they get out to, to the backcountry. I know we've had one heck of a warm uh, winter, at least down here in southern Ontario. We're getting a little bit of snow here today. But uh, we haven't had a whole lot of it, and it's funny for me to think that up north you actually have ice and snow and stuff like that, because uh, we've got none down here. But anyways, uh, even with that being said, the water's still cold, the air is still cool, the evenings are cold, and we're going to try and keep you all warmer and safer when it comes to spring trip planning. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce tonight's guests, and uh, we will get into this cool topic Uh First, uh, we have a good friend of mine, and uh, let's see, somebody that I spent a little bit of time with there at the uh, Canoe Copia. Hi, I'm Kevin Cowan, the happy camper. Woo! Yes, I'm Apostle number 14. Well, if you visited me instead, you would have been fine. It's a one sexy beast, I'm telling you. You know, I told you poopy pants, sorry about that. Did you really? <laughs> I will hold in my urine for you, Dennis. You have to remind Kevin that this is a family show. What about the chipmunks? Awesome! Hey, Kevin, how you doing, buddy? Let's take a nap. I'm good. I've been drinking tea and honey for like, what, three weeks during this whole tour thing, and I still have no voice. Yeah, man, you were on a major tour, eh? You did, you did three weekends in a row at uh, different locales, the Outdoor Adventure Show, uh, the Quiet Adventure Symposium, and Canoe Copia. Yeah, and then drove back during the week to actually go and teach my class. Wow, that's crazy. That's I'm crazy. getting old. Yeah, but, maybe we'll yeah, chat no, about I lost, I lost my voice. I'm getting it back. I, it happened last year, though. Remember last year, I, I told myself, and my doctor said, do not talk. Do not talk. Come back from your, and then I was on your show on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Who, who are you to uh, not defy a doctor, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> take your advice and do what you need to do with it yeah that's cool anyways let's bring up our other two panelists here as well uh from freaking nature we have tunis richards how you doing buddy good how are you good haven't seen much of you lately there it's good to see uh you're still out and about 
Yeah, active on other platforms and just trying to get this business stuff in order with the Freaking Nature Co. It's taking up a lot of our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, anytime you're uh, going into business for yourself, you got to get all the ducks in a row and uh, make sure things are, are good, right? But things are looking good, actually. Uh, some of the products you. Uh, you yep. can your just, pump, pump out of there are great. We just released our uh, belts today, so that was the, the latest, but it's been a, a steep learning curve, that's for sure. There you go. So it's selfless promotion. Uh, where can people find these things? Freakofnatureco.com. There you go, yes, people. Our website. Yeah, let's see if we could sell it, make them sell out of belts <laughs> tonight. There, there's the goal. <laughs> and anyways, our, our last panelist for uh, tonight's show, we have good old Nate Muskoka, the clumsy enthusiast. How you doing, man? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Explain clumsy enthusiast. Well, that just about sums it up, you know, <laughs> expert of expert of nothing, but enthusiast of many things. I thought that was this guy over here, the clumsy enthusiast right there. Oh, yeah. no, actually, well, if I'm, if I, I did, since Kevin's not wearing a happy camper hat, I thought I'd wear mine <laughs> just to make sure. Oh, oh nice. Oh, well, yeah, you see a picture of that. That's nice. Yeah. That actually looks like me on the portage. That's sweet. <laughs> I think that yeah. is with your your new signature pack on there. I'm pretty yeah, cool. and also it looks like I'm pooping myself. <laughs> <laughs> Happens with old age, Kev. Well, yeah, that's uncontrollable though, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, Kevin. Yeah. When we when we talk about packing, we'll talk about some uh, some depends for you this time around this spring. It all depends if we should talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So, boys, I thought uh, tonight there we'd cover a bunch of uh, bases. I, I, I talked in the green room about a few of the things that I wouldn't mind talking about uh, if we have time to, to cover it all because there's so many different things or aspects that come into play when it comes to planning a uh, uh, a spring or an ice out trip, as many call it. Uh, I can't call it ice out because I have no ice, ice here, but uh, I'll just call it uh, the fair weather season, right? But uh, – what are some of the biggest differences that uh, we're going to run into between spring trip planning and, and summer uh, canoe trips or, or backcountry trips? Or what, what, are, what are some of the biggest differences, Kevin? Oh, me. Uh, um, oh. Well, I, I think the biggest thing we should uh, look for is in enthusiasm. Uh, we're pumped. We're, we're ready. In fact, we were ready like two weeks ago because the spring was here way too early. We're like, I'm good. I'm good. And then and then disaster happens. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so calm down. Uh, I want to be out as much as you, but calm down and be smart about it. If you're going to go out this time of year, I mean, my lake is open now, but I was working in Halliburton today and the lakes weren't open. And that's literally an hour drive difference, right? So, Nate, uh, your lakes aren't open, right? The small ones are definitely not. The big ones are, but there's still a lot of ice along the shorelines. Yeah, and Tunis, like, like, probably even more so, right? No, nope. Yeah, they're all frozen. The Ottawa River is open, but that's about it. But, but here we are, uh, like, I don't know about you guys, but I, I was driving today and I saw this open little bit of water up in Helburn and went, oh, I, I compel that, I compel that. And I don't have any money, so I can't get a, a dry suit or a wetsuit. I have a chicken vest, I call it. I don't know if you guys have that. A new, new cream. Yeah, it's a, new, it's a cheap version of a wetsuit that okay. got on sale. In fact, I got it used, so it smells. But, um, uh, but yeah, so we want to rush out and get out there. And I think that's great, but be safe about it. And I've done my stupid things in the past where I've gone on day trips this time of year and flipped in the water. And actually uh, I was with a group and I didn't bring extra clothing and this woman did. So I had to wear her clothing. And now and then you'll see a picture of me wearing some clothing. And that's where that comes from. But yes. So calm the enthusiasm and be smart about it. Are we talking about safety already? My God. So no, well, we, we will get, you know what? Safety, safety is going to fall into play throughout the whole evening, I think, because uh, hypothermia, the risk of hypothermia, whether it's uh, from getting wet or not having proper uh, sleeping uh, gear and stuff like that, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can, can go wrong. And that's why we're having this show is to make sure everybody's kind of prepared for the entire thing, right? Because yeah. You may be talking about a canoe trip, Kevin, but uh, guys like Tunis down here are thinking about, you know, spring brookies. They want to get out there and get fishing, and they want to get into the back country, right? So uh, what a little bit about that, Tunis. Uh, well, the same thing as Kevin was touched on would basically be safety, you know, clothing changes. The weather is sporadic nowadays, well, all the time, but especially now. You can go from, what, 25 Celsius difference between, like, daytime to 
nighttime to even just even when the clouds roll in, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You got you got your spring brookie trips already planned, or are you working? No, on No, unfortunately, this is an off year for me. I'm actually in the middle of a career change, so I'm in a hiring uh, process right now, and that's kind of put a damper on a lot of our plans. We have ideas, but uh, nothing set in stone. Oh, I'm ahead of you now, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Nate? What do you got planned for the spring season? Uh, you got a new family member now, and I, that uh, is that going to put the brakes on you a little bit? Well, first I'd like to yeah. First, I'd like to acknowledge that it only took I think it took us under five minutes to begin talking about Kevin wearing Depends and women's clothing. So I'd like to acknowledge that <laughs> new record. <clears throat> Good stuff. Yep. Well done, everybody. Um, but yeah, new family member. She's uh, six months old today, actually. So um, trying to deal with uh, deal with that amazing, amazing but tiring reality. Um, every day is something new, but. Uh, there are some plans in the works. Um, I'm going to try to do the the classic uh, Crownland overnighter uh, once the lakes open up on a little solo spot I usually go to every year. Um, and then there's sort of a trip in the works with a couple of the fellows that I went on a on a lake trout uh, trip with last spring um, to do a brook trout trip uh, this spring. Hopefully the second week of May. Um, cool. So we'll we'll see we'll see if that comes together. It may or may not, but uh, that's what it's looking like right now. It's Is funny, that a, it said that about the second week in May. So usually it's the second week in May. My buddies and I have gone for like a couple of decades, right? Last year, we, we had to change it to the third week in, in May because my buddy Speedo Man had to go to the tropical island with his, his wife and we're all upset with him because we caught trope and nothing like we would have uh, on the second week. This year, I'm thinking, no, we need to be out there early because, because it's going to be a, an early spring and it's going to get warm really quick and they're going to move down. And of course, the canoe museum is opening on May 12th, and mm. I'm not going to miss that, right? Okay. So I said, guys, like I'm not going to Tropical Island, but I, I, I need to be there. At, well, I don't need to be. I want to be there at the opening of the canoe museum. Oh, Kevin! Oh, oh. So uh, actually, it was over here tonight. Like I bought him some new lures, and uh, he's like, "We're not going to catch fish." I went, "Well, but we're talented individuals. We, we can catch fish, so we'll figure that out." And it's tough. I think we're going to do the the streams for brookies because, you know, I think that's probably the best bet. Um, but I, I got to say, you're going the best time. If you're going Mother's Day weekend or around before, but even a lot of people are thinking the end of uh, April, as soon as the season opens, that's mm -hmm. when it's time to go now. Yeah, that's when I'll probably try to do my little uh, solo crown lander um, and uh, see how that goes. And then that'll give me a good idea of how the uh, – if the fishing trip second week of May comes together, how that might go. So do you, yeah. do you, do you expect Nate uh, that ice will be completely gone by maybe second week of May? Yeah. And the reason why I ask is because I, I, I may be guiding my first trip for a few buddies that uh, want to get out. So. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think um, unless something really wild happens with the weather around here, I don't think we're, in the sort of shape where all of a sudden there's going to be new sheets forming in the middle of the lake the next three weeks that are going to be substantial enough to still hang around second week of May. I mean, you never know, but it's going to take a long stretch of really cold temps to, to make that happen. So the, the one thing guys, so um, I, I might be old, but the um, mountain ash berries are still hanging their fruit and the birds haven't eaten them yet and got drunk off them because they ferment through the winter. That means the birds know something's coming. Well, I sort of I, I love your folk uh, I love your <laughs> your folk nature forecasting. I hope you're wrong, but I think that's a really cool way to uh, to sort of tell what's uh, what's going on. Uh, so we'll see. Everyone, mark your calendars. Today's the day the birds are still waiting for the berries to ferment. We will hopefully Kevin just didn't curse us into like a, a three feet of snow the first first Friday in May or something. Second winter, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, when, when, when is a good time to start planning your ice out trip? No, please don't say uh, as soon as soon as fall hits. <laughs> now, uh, now, I mean, um, uh, I know the Algonquin backcountry is already booking up along the west side. So uh, yeah, now is okay. Now that, is that, the, that's what I kind of meant because a lot of people their their ice out trips or their spring trips usually. 
in our area anyways in Ontario tend to flock to Algonquin, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I watched uh I've been watching YouTube videos to try to slake my enthusiasm a little um to get on the water and uh, i've been watching some uh you know all along the nipissing for everybody's spring trips um i watched a couple last night of a of a fella that drove seven and a half hours for his uh, spring brookie trip on the uh on the nipissing river so that's that's real enthusiasm right there and and the footage and this was just last year when he pulled into the parking lot at tim river access was jammed full full of cars so well, yeah it's it's uh it's sort of like a, a go-to spot for that but of course there's as kevin knows and and uh, tunis knows there's plenty of other places you can go for for spring brook trip the whole park <laughs> yeah <Spoiler. laughs> the, the big thing about the rivers though too is uh, i generally do not fish the the rivers in late april early may because the, they haven't hit the holes yet they haven't um they're still all over the place so if you weren't really want to catch brook trout on, on the Nipissing or the Upper Petawawa or the Tim, uh, go mid mid uh, May when um, the black flies are just coming out, but they're not biting yet. That sort of period of maybe two hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I, I I find that people go too early. And yes, if you're on a small pond or lake, and there's still ice around the um, the edges, the trick is is to throw um, a, a lure under that ice because that's where they they're held up that's fine but i don't think i don't think you're going to gain i think this is a huge debate in the canoe um uh um angling world and we should solve this right now is that should you go like four days after ice out or should you wait for a bit for the bugs to bite in between <clears throat> i think uh just before the bugs bite and like a week or two after ice out right i think the water warms up just a little bit. They become a little bit more active. The forest comes to life. That's my cue is when you start to see things bud and stuff like that. It's time to start hitting the water. <clears throat> I find it fine as long as you actually let the fuse go with the dynamite and throw it in the water to kill all the come up. That's the time for me. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I know none of this because I and Tunis knows and Kevin knows I've never caught a brook trout. So. We'll get you there. Yeah, you do that reaction every time, Kevin. <laughs> That's because that means you're not a true man. Oh, oh, easy, man. Easy. Uh, right. Fathering two daughters is uh, right. yeah. Hit I'm low. Just, just joking. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so it's got to happen. I, I'm hope. I'm hope. Really hoping for uh, this spring that it'll be. Uh, it'll be the time. It'll probably scare the crap out of me because I won't even be fishing for him, and I'll end up catching one or something. Right? So, You'll be pumped. Yeah. Cool. Hey, look at Tim, Tim from Super Good Camping says, "Me either, Dennis." Uh, there it is. Yeah, he's not caught one either. And then Donald Dakota, hey, what the heck, Dennis? I don't. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Right. You know, I well, think the the problem is that I never get out early enough to get on the uh, on the hot rookie season. Right. So it's the way you were brought up, though. I mean, I was brought up by doing brook trout fishing with my dad, and then I got into canoeing. Right. So that this time of year, I'm like, I'm, I can't sleep. I got maps everywhere. I don't know about you guys. I have maps everywhere and I've watched, I don't know how many videos of, of people brook trout fishing. I'm trying to figure out where they are and I'm looking at the rock behind them. Oh, I know that lake. I, 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 I that sort of thing. And then it was all over. We'll just do summer trips and catch bass and walleye. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So when we're uh, talking about uh, planning spring trips, where, where, where should it, where should it really start? Do we just start with a time frame? Do we start with actually planning a destination, or do we start thinking gear, food? Like, where, where, where's the best place to start? I think for me, it'd be destination first, right? What is your goal for spring, right? Like, is it fishing oriented? Is it you just want to get out in nature? For us, it's you know, people are now identify me and Britt as like fishing but we're still very much like in it for camping and wilderness right so for us it's where do we want to go and how can we incorporate that stuff along the way mm -hmm. and then as for the clothing and stuff you stated that kind of is universal for us every year you always pack for the worst and hope for the the best kind of thing <clears throat> do, you, do you actually bring more clothing with you than you would on on a normal trip like Oh, 100%. Are you like, bringing um, right from light to heavy stuff? Yeah. Like my typical layering will be 
either fleece or merino base layer and then like a mid-grade fleece and then a puffy or something for the top and then like you just adjust whichever one for if you're portage or not portaging if there's wind whatever and then we usually have a spare set of wool merino and socks all that stuff in case you do get wet or for nighttime whatever so mm -hmm. it's usually it's definitely heavier than compared to like summer <clears throat> nate nate you could probably share some on that because you uh you have a background in retail with uh with a lot of clothing yeah um well to speak to the earlier question i think for me i have sort of before i even started dabbling back in fishing uh just a couple of years ago you know until then i hadn't hadn't really i would just drag my line in the water and if something grabbed it great if not I, you know it was of no real concern to me um getting back into trout fishing the last couple of years has definitely made me a little bit more tuned into where i'm heading um but it still doesn't it still doesn't rule like it, it's not my uh reigning factor in choosing a location so i sort of have traditions about where i like to go for my first trip of the season uh, in my little crown land spots that i like to haunt and uh that's where i'll end up and i'll fish if it's appropriate and if it's a if it's a good spot to fish um but if not it's just it's just about me being able to get out there enjoy enjoy some sun enjoy some spring weather maybe read a read a book by the fire and and uh hang out and just enjoy being back out you know camping like that um for the first time of the season um if i happen to be in an area where there's some good fishing then heck yeah i'll drop my line and and uh and do some fishing as well but it's not my sort of um prime directive when i'm heading out there for the first time uh for clothing i sort of like to think about it this way after after some consideration if your canoe were to turn over and you were to dunk your pack would you be would you be able to carry on with your trip um if the weather was cold so what would you do what would you pack what would that look like or would you be turned around and heading home if that happened mm -hmm. so i sort of backtrack from there and i make sure that my pack is compartmentalized properly with waterproof sacks uh, waterproof uh, dry bags um and that i have pretty much spare everything um and i don't you know, I trust on the, I trust the forecast with a margin of like 10 degrees. <laughs> That's the other thing, right? So the for, like Tunis was alluding to there, the forecast can differ wildly. Um, and uh, you need to be prepared for it because, you know, unlike July, um, you know, it can all of a sudden, if it said it was going to be minus two, then guess what? All of a sudden it could be minus 12 and you need to be prepared for that. Um, and if you're not, then, you know, it's your own fault. <laughs> Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, so warm stuff, stay away from the cotton, um, you know, uh, stuff like uh, merino wool is absolutely fantastic. Stuff to block the wind. The wind in the spring can be a very sharp factor in, in how you feel the temperature, right? The sun can mm -hmm. be out, but if you've got that stiff breeze coming off of freezing cold water, that's going to have a real bite to it. Um, and uh, so, you know, something good to block the wind. Um I do still like a lot of polar fleece because if your sleeve of your polar fleece gets wet, you can pretty much wring it out and keep going and it's still going to have some thermal value, right? Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of multiple layers, stuff to block the wind, and then of course a real good shell set to keep you dry because uh, when those clouds all of a sudden appear that said that they wouldn't, uh, you need to be prepared to get wet and, or not get wet uh, so you can still stay warm. Sure. And we, what you're wearing right now is a key thing that I, I always find when I'm, uh, even in the summertime, eh, bringing a hoodie, something to keep that wind off the back of your neck, right? Because like you say, you could have a windproof jacket or something on, but if that wind, everybody tends to put their back to the wind, right? Nobody wants it blowing in their face. Having a hoodie or something along that lines that's going to stop that wind from biting at the back of your neck is, is pretty key as well, so... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, a, a buff is always really handy that way as well. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Now, what, what about when it comes to gear? Um, I, I see, a, or I've seen a lot of people will do hot tent camping in, uh, in the early mm -hmm. spring. Um, a lot of people just regular tents or hammocks. Uh, is there a favorite for, for you guys on panel here? Do you prefer hot tents in the spring or what's the deal there? I, I, I think that the, the, the thing about, um, shoulder season 
is hypothermia. Like in the winter time, I'm not really worried about hypothermia. I'm used to the cold and I can deal with the cold. Fall, I'm like, oh, it's cold now. Oh, oh uh, I got myself in trouble. Spring, oh, I'm very excited to get out. Oh, oh, forgot it's cold out there. And I remember a trip in Algonquin. Uh, I did a video called Nightmare in, in Nightmare in Gata. We went to Gata Lake um, near Booth Lake, and it snowed. It was minus, I don't know, it was minus something. It was cold. Marina wool saved me, to be quite honest. It's not a name brand. It's a type of wool. Um but we also moved back in the bush to camp. We didn't stay at the campsite because the wind was really brutal. We caught no fish. But we always remember that that trip. But it was it was that time where you could get hypothermic because you, you didn't know it was coming, right? And that's where it's going to happen. So I, I think gear is really important. I, I pack extra stuff, extra jackets in case something happens, extra wool in case something happens, extra those those blankets you put inside your sleeping bag that gives you another 10 degrees, the, the SOL blankets, I bring those. Um, we bring an extra tarp and yeah, there's a lot of gear, especially if you want to go more in the interior, that's a lot of stuff to carry. And then you're out of shape too. Uh, cause you're doing freaking trade shows all the time and talking about it instead of doing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you got to think of that, but at the same time, that's when it's going to happen is when you're going to flip in a little Creek, uh, in, in late April, early May, and then get really cold and chilled and things are going to go bad. So yeah. Yeah. But what about the the hot tent thing? Are you? Do you oh yeah, you, I've seen you, Kevin. You you enjoy hot tenting in the spring. Yeah, so, so he asked me a question. I went Whoa, squirrel. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. Uh, I do a lot of hot tenting in the fall, late fall on trip, and I would do it in the spring as well. The only problem is the weight, right? Do you really need it? If it's a really hot spring, like who's been on a, on a, a, a ice out trip and it's like tropical temperatures, and you didn't think of that, and you're wearing all this heavy wool stuff. You got a freaking hot tent and a wood stove. You never really don't need it. So I, I tend to see, I, I, did you use the hot tent maybe in the fall, uh, in the spring, maybe April, but no. I do go on a trip though in late April, uh, whether it's backpacking or canoeing. And I don't, I don't film it actually. It's my first trip out. I really find what I call the sweet spot. I found, I know a bunch of places I go to. I don't care about fishing. I, I read a book. Uh, I just soak in the solitude in the sun. I love winter, but I rejoice the coming of the new season. And I, I'm a huge person with the new flowers. So I, I, I gather leeks. Um, I love identifying the new flowers coming up. That's what I do. And I just rejoice with that. So even though it sounds like I'm a big brook show person, my very first trip is really to go out and check all the new flowers coming up. Yeah. I, I Also for you, with, with that being said there, yeah, this is, that's your reprieve from the show season too, right? It really is actually to be quite honest. It is because I <laughs> after that show season, like I love doing those shows, but after a while, I'm not talking about it anymore. I'm doing it. My daughter always tells me, Dad, like stop talking, just go out. And then actually, when I go out, I, it sounds weird, but when I go out, I say nothing, especially on solo trips, because I can't mm -hmm. stand my own voice. Cool. Now, what about you, Nate? Uh, what what's your preference? You you're pretty much just a cold tent camper for the spring, right? Yeah, just like Kevin said, the just the, the sheer weight and bulk of, of lugging around a hot tent. Um, I'm open to the idea if it was a really cool sort of paddling spot or like a, um, um, you know, if you think of places like uh, like Tomogamy where you can launch it, launch a tenner and throw your, uh, you know, if, uh, I know that's probably a bad word, but throw your hot tent and stuff in there and head out to a spot and base camp for a couple of days, then yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, great. Uh, but yeah, to start portaging a, a hot tent and stove through uh, through the interior somewhere, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. A, nope. Yeah. No thanks. I'd rather I'd rather bulk up on the uh, on the sleep system and the and the layers and do it that way. I because uh, I'm I'm older though, guys. If you can help me this, I'm looking at a, doing a baker tent maybe this early spring. But I, you know, where to find one that's well cost effective. <laughs> but I would I love to do the Bill Mason Baker tent in early spring. And just base camp on Riley Lake or or Obiongo, whatever. So you know, help me out there if you if you know a good tent to get. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, um, the guys that make um, prospector tents for Algonquin Outfitters out at Oxtong Lake, I think they do a Baker tent as well. You're a genius. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, come to Canoe Outdoor go. Adventure Show to get all these tips and ideas, cool. Kevin. Even I should have married Nate when I had the chance. <laughs> 
He's got his Golden Girls cup. Cars, cars, <laughs> cups. I'm doing two T's now. To get my throat cold. <laughs> That's awesome. The, to, to take a step back there, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of chat going on in the uh, in the chat there tonight about uh, about wetsuits and stuff like that. So, go, taking a step back to clothing. Not everybody, as mentioned, uh, as Kevin mentioned, can afford to go out and buy themselves a, a wetsuit, right? Because they are very, very costly for something that you might not use too often. Well, what what, what, are, what are some tips and ideas as far as getting out there and paddling when the water is so cold? Oh, is boy. it more caution? Taking more caution when you're paddling, or Dennis, you this is like. Um... And this can be a big topic. This can be like a hornet's nest topic, really, because um, I think you were referring to dry suits, and, and dry suits are a fantastic. Okay, dry suits, yeah, I, um, I don't own one either. I can't afford it either. <laughs> uh, you know, a fantastic mm -hmm. amenity to allow you to to get out there and you know, in theory, stay stay warm if you're submerged, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they you know start out at around a, a half decent one starts out at around a thousand bucks plus um and so that's a that's a big sort of gate for people um so i think oh you know way back in college i took a course on risk in recreation and i think um you know what we need to recognize is is that uh and and you know kevin knows this too with his his education background is that humans are, are driven to take risks and and where we were before uh to sort of you know uh um get the species moving forward now we do it to you know in in how we recreate right uh so it's just part of our nature to to uh to want to take risks and in, in how we recreate and how we do things and it's part of our development as human beings and and i think it's just really important to acknowledge uh that with risk there comes great rewards but then there also you know comes great consequences with that uh and that goes for um, you know, someone someone doing 140 on the highway, or someone paddling across a big chunk of open water uh, the second the ice gets out in a flannel shirt, right? Yeah. Um, and so it all needs to be taken in stride. And and the more you educate yourself, the more you're going to be uh, aware of the risk that you're taking when you head out there um, in a you know in a cotton hoodie and uh, you're kneeling on your life jacket, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's everybody's choice that they need to make for themselves. And and the best thing that we can do is just educate them about the consequences uh, of those choices. So uh, I I am fortunate enough that with my background I was able to obtain a dry suit. Yeah. That I is that my size? That you know what it, it could be like. I was I was surprised. I, I tried it on the other day. I was surprised I still fit in it. So uh, I bet you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you if you can, obviously a dry suit is a is a fantastic plus. Uh, a wet suit, um, which by the way needs to be wet to carry its thermal value to your skin, so just be aware of that. Um, a wet suit is far less expensive. You can pick them up at Costco for a hundred bucks in various thicknesses. The thicker it is, the warmer it is, but the harder it is to move around in. And you do need to be wet in order for it to function because it traps a very thin layer of water between your skin and the membrane of the neoprene, which then warms up and thereby warms you up. So just be aware of that. A wetsuit isn't sort of like a, the same alternative. Um, it's, it's not, a, you know, it's not a direct alternative to a dry suit. So. Right. Yeah. The dry suit is what I actually meant. Like I say, yeah. but what, what does this guy know? Right. Cause I don't own either one. Um, so when, if you don't own a dry suit or a wetsuit, um, and you you are paddling. I, I would think it might be a good idea to have a, sort of a, a ditch kit or, or something handy because you mentioned about uh, packing your pack and compartmentalizing everything there and dry bags and such. But <laughs> what if you can't get it your bag? It's uh, uh, when I paddle in colder conditions or even uh, on regular trips in the summertime. I, I like to have a, a spare bag, a dry bag tied down, and it's like it's attached to my, uh, my one of my thwarts. That if something happens, and I keep things in there like my poncho um, for you know quick deployment, uh, some snacks, uh, navigational stuff, right? Whether it's my compass or, or whatever, um, fire starter. What about carrying extra clothing in there? Like you say, the stuff to get out of the wet stuff into the dry stuff, right? Yeah. So luckily for me, I was sort of uh, 
um, mentored by uh, Mr. Pine Martin when I started paddling by myself in colder conditions. And uh, he has a fantastic ditch kit system that I sort of adopted. And so uh, before I had a dry suit, when I was paddling in very cold water, I would have a sealed up dry bag very, very close to me that contained everything I would need to go from wet to dry um, as quickly as possible and start a fire without needing any silly tricks. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the key elements um, that sort of, you know, informed how I would pack that dry bag. Um, and I, and I still do that quite a bit. So uh, can, can you like, share some of those items? Yeah, sure. A couple yeah. lighters. So a couple lighters, right? Um, some really easy fire starter that those lighters are going to work uh, really easily with to get a, to get a good flame going very quickly. Um, and then, yeah, a complete change of clothes, including like a bulkier layer. So whether that's your down puffy that you usually wear around in December, you've got that jammed in there because it's a really good layer to just throw on. Um, and it can be something even like, uh, like a poncho that could double up as an emergency tarp, right? Um, and it can be one of those SOL bivvies that everyone's been mentioning in the chat that Kevin mentioned before. Those are fantastic. They pack down very, very small and they're really easy to use. Um, so yeah, those are all things that go into my dry bag. Um, and I do have a satellite communication device too. So if all of a sudden I realize that I'm, I'm not able to do this and I'm just not getting any warmer, then, uh, you know, it might be time to realize I've made a big whopping mistake. Mm -hmm. Tunis, you're pretty quiet over there. What, what can you add to that? I mean, Nate pretty much hit it all on the head. I always carry a lighter or some sort of uh, fire starting kit on me and then multi-tool knife whatever some kind of edge for prep whatever cutting free that kind of thing and then like you said if you can get to your main kit great but at least you have something to do something with and on that i would say you should practice these skills when it's not an emergency right like learning where to find, I know it's good to have tinders and stuff on you, but where can you find it when it's wet? How much prep is it going to take for you to actually start a fire? Learning to calm down and just take a breath to do it is a skill on its own, right? Like mm -hmm. when you're scared, you know, it's uh, things happen really quick and usually not for the better. So that'd be my take. Yeah. Kevin? It's interesting today. I did my stick stove uh, with my students today, and uh, we had bad weather. Like it was like uh, it was really snowing a lot today, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, we're going out today." Yes, we go out every day. Like, come on, and we did stick stoves, and they're miserable. And it was wet snow too, blowing snow. And I said, "Guys, um, if you ever went over in your canoe in the spring when you go on your trip, you, first of all, you gotta get all that stuff off." and get a tarp set up like it doesn't have to be a major tarp a reflective tarp get that fire going get underneath that and get warm remember that what was that movie um oh oh, oh uh something with wolves dances with wolves no the the, the oh. canadian thing the um oh farley mowat goes up north and he goes through the ice buck not buck no that's a good movie no um uh oh uh, something with what, what's Farley Mowat's the book, and then it was made into a movie. People, people of the Deer. No, no, oh. that was made into a movie. <laughs> anyway, he goes through the ice, <laughs> and the funny scene is he's standing around the fire, completely naked, uh, trying to get warm. Everybody's well, why he's doing that. Well, that that's what you have to do. Is like get everything off and get everything dry, and get a reflective uh, tarp. So I in my ditch kit I have a reflective tarp. And what you guys said is make sure you know how to get a fire going. So today these guys were trying to get a fire going. I went, guys, like you need to get a fire going. <laughs> and oh no, we're good, we're good. And I went, no, you need it better, better than this. You need to know your tree ID. You know, you need to know conifer, deciduous, um, pencil wood to get it started, bir uh, birch bark, and everything else. And they're like, no, I just put gasoline on it, man. I went, no, no. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, if I ever went over in a, in a spring trip and I, I would go to shore immediately, get a reflective tarp up, get a fire going, take everything off, right? And then, hello, I'm naked, whatever, I don't care. And then dry my skin off and then get my new clothing on. If I had that in my pack, if I had a ditch kit, 
I don't have extra clothing in my ditch kit. A ditch kit to me is this big and it's it's strapped onto your body or your thwart, but I usually put it on my body because you don't know if the canoe is going to go away from you, right? Yeah. So I do have that reflective blanket. So that makes a big difference. And while you have the reflective blanket on around the fire with the reflective tarp on, then you can get all your clothing. If it's merino wool, uh, wool will actually still be somewhat warm if it's somewhat dry, right? And then work through that. Here's the biggest thing, though, I got to say, again, older guy, don't let it happen. Don't run that rapid. Walk it. Be yeah, slow. Yeah. Cut down your risk, right? If it's know if it. it's windy, don't go out. Know your limits. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and in a case like that, uh, in your ditch kit, uh, it's not the time to be a bushcrafter and start trying to build a fire with a, a fire striker. Uh, like Nate said, and uh, Tunis, make sure you have like you know a good reliable lighter or two because you never know one could fail. You could you need some redundancy there. Uh, those reflect. I still have no. I, I still have this. Uh, th th that's really good if everything's wet though. So make sure you have that. But yeah. have a piece of inner tube. You ever see that burn? Duct tape with, with bug repellent sprayed on it. That's right. amazing. Boom. Yeah. Not. Yeah. yeah no, know how to start a fire. Just go in your backyard and practice. Know how to start a fire. Pretty much. What what about those reflector uh, or those reflective uh, survival blankets? They're like a piece of tin foil, pretty much. Oh. That, uh, that are, you know, how, what's the proper way to use them? Because if you wrap it on you, you're going to lose heat through conduction, right? Sorry, we're losing everybody. Is this something I said? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do, Kevin? What'd you do? <laughs> Sorry, I'll I just just drop two in the The soul, yeah. It's a survival outdoor, survival outdoors longer, right? Is that a bivy? Yeah. Now, does that have insulative per, uh, purpose, or is it just uh, re like heat retention? Or it's a big old reflective sleeping bag, right? Oh no, hang on, hang on. Now you have to try and figure out how to roll it back up and put it back in the sleeve, right? Yeah, but what I just re what I just realized that I didn't know before is that this will um, it velcros out to a tarp, so it goes into a square. So very handy, very cool. Yeah, so I, so I pack two of those, Nate, and, and for that reason. I use one for the tarp and one for my body. That's a good idea to have two. You know why, though? Because on the that, that trip I talked about, um, uh, Nightmare and Gata, I, tried, I was trying out a new uh, sleeping bag, and it didn't work, and it got really cold. And we will not talk about this beyond the conversation here, but I had to go in the sleeping, sleeping bag, in Speedo Man's sleeping bag, and cuddle with him. <laughs> this is a true story. I said... We'll never talk about this again, but I'm going to freeze tonight if we don't do this. So I had to spoon him, and we survived the night. I can't believe I told you that story. So you're a big spoon? I was the mini spoon. And... <laughs> the big spoon. Yeah, you, and you only told 149 people tonight, Kevin. So oh, great. Small. Okay. 152 if you count us in the panel. Okay. I, I feel much better about myself now. Thank you. <laughs> well... So when it when it comes to navigating in the spring, uh, what are some of the differences between springtime navigation and um, and any navigation that might happen any other time of year? Kevin, it's a great oh question. No, Tunis, go ahead. You're I was gonna say I'm trying to think. I was like, that's a great question because I'm like, I don't know. Compared to winter, I guess they obviously want snow as a factor, but like. Well, river river travel, eh? Water levels are obviously water, water, be... water levels are my big thing right now. I don't know about you guys, but I'm freaking out about this summer and the spring because we won't have won't have no water. Yeah. And um, I'm changing my entire trip uh, for the springs because I'm thinking, well, I can't get through there. I, I don't think I will. The you know Goma too, the the trout streams I go up there every year. I don't I don't think they'll have no, any water, so I have to change my route plan. So or. If it's major flood, that's what happens too. Like the Grand, the Thames, all, all the rivers on the Nith in the in the south. Right now, we usually hear these times of people drowning or getting into those sweepers because they're all, woohoo, spring, spring, and then this massive flood water. 
And actually, I don't know if you know this, but the police can't tell you not to do what you do. They can actually rescue you, but they can't say, do that. Well, actually, in rivers, that's different. But on my lake, when the ice was going off, people were still out in the ice. And then, so everybody was calling the cops and the cops came and said, we can't tell them to get off the ice. We can go and rescue them and we'll be pissed off if we have to do that, but we can't tell them to get off the ice. So that's what we have to worry about now. Mind you, it's, it's maybe not as much as in the last couple of years, whatever. So water levels, uh, look at the map and say, no, it'd be fine in the spring. We'll be, we'll be good. The Tim River, for example. Don't ever do the Tim River in Algonquin in low water. You'll, you'll just curse it. You'll hate Algonquin. You'll never go back. Um, and usually in the spring, it's, it's good. But I think right now I wouldn't do the Tim this year. I, I think it, it, you'll just be slogging it. Mm -hmm. But the, then again, if, if water levels with uh, spring runoff are high, I, I've seen portages that have been completely flooded. Right. Oh yeah. Like what? I, I've been. I've I've walked. Um. Uh, or sorry. I've paddled through port. Like have you ever done that on a, on a portage? You're like, why am I walking through this water? You just get in the canoe and paddle across. Pull yourself up. Yeah. 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 Well, would it would it make a big difference to the trip that you would be planning? Yeah. The, I, well, that's all I do in my life is I plan trips and yeah, I'm obsessed by it. And I, I always think, no, this looks good. But then you're 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 doing it now where you're so enthusiastic, and then when the trip happens, you're like, yeah, I didn't know there was that hill. I should have like, you know, looked at the maps better. <laughs> right, right. How how do you pull a canoe uphill, Kevin? I just yeah, I'm old, so I I I, I you know, <laughs> I just I just drag it over the snow. Yeah. Have you ever been on a trip in the spring, early spring, where there's snow still on the portage? Yes. Yep. I have. And then you're walking across it, and you realize. Why am I doing that? You just put it on the snow and drag it. <laughs> this is true. Some canoes might be more susceptible to that than others, right? So, yeah. well, I was finding a rental canoe is a good one. Sure. So, what what are some of the benefits to paddling in the spring as opposed to any other season? Doing it quiet, <laughs> less traffic, forest is coming to life. I don't know. It's personally my favorite time of year. Um especially after a cold, long winter, with the exception of this one, because it's obviously been pretty tame. But, you know what I mean? Birds are chirping. Like Kevin said, flowers are starting to come in. Fishing is good. Wildlife settings are great. It's just a magical time. And like I said, for me, I'm a shoulder season weather guy. I don't really like plus 30. So, like, I like when you get a nice May, early June day, and it's plus 25, but then you're still you – know, sweater or puffy at night trying to stay warm so <clears throat> it's it's great mm -hmm. what, what do you think nate uh what are some of the benefits to paddling in the spring oh yeah i love or how quiet country it, camping for that matter yeah yeah i love how quiet it is i love that you still get a lot of the same views that you do in the winter because the foliage is still coming in so the the vistas are usually a little more clear um if you hit the timing right, there's no bugs quite yet, or they're just still just figuring out what their uh, bug life is about, so they're not biting quite yet. Um, and uh, and yeah, just the fact that it feels like you're is sort of the primal you're fulfilling a primal need to shake off winter and sort of like uh, attune yourself to a to like a new a new reality in the season. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, uh, you know, and still being able to do that uh, every season out in nature and, and spring just feels extra special that way because uh, you're coming out of, uh, you know, a long period of time where it's dark early and it's cold. And, and if you're not a super enthusiastic winter camper, then uh, you, you know, you're probably not out uh, enjoying the backcountry quite the same way as you would the rest of the season. So yeah, spring, spring feels really special that way. And, and uh, the quiet goes, uh, goes a long way as well. That's for sure. Sure. Nothing like a nice crisp morning too, eh? When you wake up yeah. after a nice warm sleep, get out there, get that coffee going, and uh, yeah, yeah. How about yourself, yeah. Kevin? You uh, you you teach a lot about bird identification, tree ID, and plant uh, ID, and stuff like that. What what are things that people should be expecting to see, or what what should they be looking for when uh, when they're they're planning, you know, backcountry in the spring? 
Well, I'm a big birder, so just that they're they're nesting, so they're staying at that area. They're not going through, so that that means that means that habitat is really important if they're nesting there, right? Whippoorwills, like someone mentioned, um, uh, even the the, the frog, uh, even the toad calling, right? And the frog calling. My dear spring peepers, I'm like, okay, I get it. Whippoorwills too, I get it. Shut the hell up. <laughs> okay, I love you to bits, but it's three in the morning. But it's what um, Tunis has said. It's like the the, light, the 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 woods is coming alive. Winter is fantastic, but I find it a miracle that these species, like like a, a salamander, can be frozen in the dirt, or an insect, or whatever it is, it can be frozen in, in the dirt, and then emerge, and then start calling and mating, getting it done, and hope they they continue through the next year. Nature is phenomenal. It is to watch that happening around you while you're sipping your tea and, and soaking in the sun or swatting a mosquito. Yeah. Um, I, I think we rejoice with that. I think we, we knew that for eons, though. I think we've all, as humans, whatever culture, we've uh, well in this area, area, we've overwintered and then emerged almost like a bear, right? So there's also yeah. things, though, there's a lot of animals that don't, that don't truly hibernate. Like bears don't hibernate, they deep sleep. So right now, I, I saw a bear the other day walking the trail. Why? It's because, well, it's time to, to get moving. Uh, skunks, the same. Groundhogs are truly hi hibernators. They, they'll, they'll, they'll hibernate. Or frog or, or salamander. But, um, but there's animals that actually are just messed up right now, to be quite honest. They're like, oh, I'm free, I'm free. Oh, no, I'm cold now. I feel bad for them. Yeah. What, what do turtles do? I've always wondered that. What happened to turtles in the wintertime? They go into the mud and do a, yeah. a deep um, hibernation, and they they basically freeze. They, they 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 don't operate until it warms up. So what's happening right now? And I'm not going on a, a the whole thing about uh, global warming, whatever. But the animals are messed up. Like I was doing yeah. sap with the students um, uh, last week when it was really warm, and we had mosquitoes and moss, whatever, in the sap buckets. So they they emerged. Well, they can't go back to sleep right now. It's it's, it's going to be minus twelve now. They're going to die. There's no way they they can go back to sleep, right? So, things are all messed up. However, peace and love and everything else. And peace and love and everything else. Let's uh, you know what, we're got to take our uh, our commercial break here in about uh, three or four minutes. But I want to cover go over a few of the questions that I've been starring throughout the first uh, half of the show here. Uh, first one I'm going to pop up a uh, question from Tim over at super good top three considerations for low water this spring. Not quite sure where that question is going, but anybody. Oh, oh you're asking now. I thought we we're going to have a break and ask the question. Yeah, okay. no, no, okay, go ahead. Uh, I think you should take it, Kev. I I'm, don't really know how to answer that. Well, you're putting pressure on me here. Uh, uh, Nate, well, I, as someone who might be around along the west side of Algonquin the second week in May, like uh, water levels are a big concern. And the last thing I want to do is spend eight hours alder bashing uh, to get through a trickle of uh, of a river. Um, so, I mean, that's a that's a big concern for me. The second one, of course, um, you know, to do with that that i'm already thinking of um in my line of work that we're all thinking of is uh is what the fire season looks like so um you know that's uh low water you know dry ground um really early does not bode well for july and august in terms of uh, a wildfire risk so that's uh top of mind right now for me and um you know something we all should be aware of going into the spring especially late spring when stuff, when the air can feel cool, but all of a sudden you realize the ground is very, very dry. Um, so, yeah, here's cool, a good too for me. There you go. Well, here's a good it's scenario funny. for you, uh, and and this be a good scenario before we go to break, whatever. So, my buddy Andy, uh, he decides a couple of weeks ago to say, you know, you remember uh, what, what we did when we were 50 when we did the meanest link. I went, no. Well, when we turn 60, we're turning 60. It's his choice of where we're going this year. And I went, oh, so we're doing a three-week trip. Yeah. And you're not knowing where we're going. I'm not going to tell you where we're going. I went, well, no, 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 no. I, I can't deal with that. I know I plan all the trips. Exactly. So you don't, until you get to, I went, no, I got some considerations. Low water. If we're going to the far north, I don't want to do some Winisk River up, up at James Bay and then walk in the whole thing. 
Um, the other is ground fires. And he goes, what do you mean? I went, well, ground fires are going to be a big thing this year. So a ground fire is actually, in fact, we dealt with it today, actually, uh, with my students. So there was a ground fire. And they're like, what's that? Well, it was smoldering underneath. So there's a wildfire that happened. They put it out, but they didn't. It went into the root cellar. So the root cellar keeps it at, at, at equal uh, temperature, right? And it smolders all winter. And then it bursts up in flames again. And it gets the fire going again in the forest. We're going to see a lot of that this year. A lot of it. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that too, talking about the fires and the dryness of the season because I was at the Toronto Sportsman Show this past weekend and they, uh, I was talking to Ontario, the, the Ministry of Ontario has all kinds of displays there, fisheries and um, uh, hunting and uh, they, they had the fire, the firefighters there and it, we're, yeah, we're excited yes. about that and they were, they were mentioning that uh, they're expecting another really bad summer this year for it right and it's going to be starting much earlier into the spring based on lack of snow uh lack of moisture in the ground right so uh be careful out there people uh maintain your fires and i see uh somebody just had something uh here we go hemlocks and loons uh forest is saying uh maybe a summer with no campfires you never know right nothing worse than a stale s'more yeah yeah do you, do you hear anything about that, Nate? Uh, is that uh, with your, your your job? Do you hear anything about that? Yeah, it is something that we're preparing for, not because we know it's going to be bad, but we need to be very prepared for it if it is bad. And so we right. are actually, we are starting that now. Cool. Very cool. Uh, well, the, with that well, the good thing, though, so sorry, as a positive note, because we're all getting negative, we're all going to die soon, is actually the black flies should not be bad this year because they emerge and 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 uh, mate in running water, not stagnant water. So if, if it's a low water year, then the black flies won't be that bad. However, mosquitoes can stay in the stagnant mud for 17 to 12, year, 12 years before they emerge. And say, same with uh, deer flies. So um, good luck to you. Well, <laughs> with that being said, uh, it's time for our commercial break. We'll be right back with y'all. There's nothing like being out there. For over 50 years, we've been connecting people with nature by building classic Canadian canoe designs using the best materials available. We built a reputation on durable, dependable canoes that allow you to focus on what's important, whether that's unplugging in remote wilderness, spending quality time with your favorite people, or nailing the perfect line. Visit novacraft.com to find the perfect canoe for you and locate your nearest authorized dealer. Tonight's episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show is brought to you by Kit Products, Stick Stoves and Reflector Ovens proudly made in Canada. Algonquin Outfitters with five key locations in and around Algonquin Park to serve your backcountry needs. Salus Marine, keeping you safe on the water since 1999. Ostrom Outdoors, custom fit canoe packs and barrel harnesses. Badger Paddles, handcrafted canoe paddles made to order. And Novacraft Canoes, connecting you with nature in Canadian-made canoes since 1970. And welcome back to the second half of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. Tonight we have guests Kevin Callan. We have, well, no Kevin Callan. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm have, making tea. Uh, we have Nate. There we go. I'm making uh, tea. I'll be back. Oh, you go ahead and make your tea. Yeah, so uh, you know what? Um, we were just talking about maybe uh, the, the the threat of wildfires again uh, because last year it was really problematic throughout Ontario, all of Canada, U.S., and uh, pretty much around the world. There was a, a lot of nastiness going on. Talk about global warming, right? So maybe it will be a, uh, a warmer spring, which uh, could tend to make things a little safer out there for us. So when uh, when you're in the backcountry, uh, meal planning, 
What, let's talk a bit about meal planning. Uh, is it any different from what you would plan for uh, summertime or fall? More on the winter side. I like to have a little bit of a heavier calorie, more fat and protein based. But I mean, the, the typical go to dehydrated, whether you make it yourself or buy it, would be like pastas and all that kind of good stuff for me, anyways. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Brit Brittany also posted in the uh, chat there. She says it's a good time because your steaks don't tend to go bad. You can carry them for a couple of days longer than you would in the summertime, right? Yep, a lot more definitely fresh meals. That's for sure. Yes, yes. I'm going to take a quick little intermission here, guys. Just uh, hold on here because I need to acknowledge somebody. Uh, our good friend Christian Maloschuk from time to time likes to uh, donate. Uh, Canoe Hound Adventures memberships uh, to those who might want them in the chat. And uh, based on that there, I just have to say thank you, Santa Maloschuk, for your membership donation. <laughs> uh, had to do that. I just had to do that. So anyways, uh, grab your memberships while you can, everybody. Okay, so we're talking about food. Kevin, what do you what do you like uh, as far as food preparation is concerned for uh, spring canoe trips or backcountry trips? Uh, we take it really serious in the spring because we're so excited to be out there. So uh, our uh, annual spring fishing trip, we usually do um, a base camp. Uh, we go in as, as, as far as we can in the interior of Algonquin, and then we base camp, and then we do a bunch of lakes that we know and streams and creeks we know for, for trout. And we have a contest of who, who's the best, right? So the first night, yeah, you can bring a bunch of good meat. Um, I, I, I put it in a barrel and wrap it up in uh, in a, a newspaper print. And then the second, maybe another meat, uh, but fresh veg. And then third night, fourth night, you're getting de dehydrated, which I'm doing now. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, my whole dehydrator is going nuts right now. So, uh, but we have a we have a contest, and this is really important for you guys to do. Is like have a camp cook off contest. So we, we each canoe group makes their own meal per night, and then whoever wins at the end gets a prize. And uh, yeah, uh, we eat really well. And like uh, uh, Tuna said, said is like we do a lot of fat stuff because to keep warm. But we eat a lot of fish too. Like I, I know pe people that don't fish and don't do brook trout. I get it. But man, I, I, the idea of actually getting a lake trout and catching a lake trout and then stuffing brook trout fillets inside the lake trout and then baking on the fire with, with the onion and, and lemon. Oh, man. Never done that. It sounds delicious. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And we have fun with it, right? Because it's all like, rejoice, rejoice. We're out in the woods finally, right? Uh, on a canoe trip. For lunches, we just have snacks. Uh, everybody's responsible for their own lunches. So I'll do meat and cheeses, and then after that, I'll do crackers and stuff like that. Um, for breakfast, we do the same thing. Different people, like um, Ashley and I, I, I like uh, Irish, Scottish, he's English, whatever. And um, so we, we'll have blood sausage. Have you ever had that? Oh, sorry, Nate. I can't get past the name. <laughs> it's, it's just blood. Sausage. Congealed yeah. blood. Yeah, it's, it's delicious. Nice. <laughs> I mean, I eat marrow. It's so. like he's ready to vomit right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, but, but we do a lot of curries, a lot of um, pasta meals, a lot of um, a lot of salsa uh, dips and, and stuff like that. So it all depends how far we're going into. But I, I would generally say that we pack way too much food in the spring way too much in the fall. And when I'm doing a long summer trip, uh, I'm eating just dehydrated stuff just to uh, pack, put the weight down. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's just good to recognize that because it's still cool, especially at night, your body is burning more calories to try to keep itself warm. So pack your meals accordingly and, uh, and uh, you know, going home with a little bit of food left is better than uh, starving on the last day. I, uh, I go to the bulk, bulk food store. Uh, I do a lot of bulk food store stuff because it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. So quinoa, bulgur, um, rice, pasta. I get it all at the bulk food store, and it's local. I just walk up the road to, to do it. Right. So. There you go, Kevin. Blood sausage. It's good. I like it. 
I know. <laughs> I had to do it so is, is it safe to say that in the springtime you uh, you're more likely or, or it's a lot easier to carry fresh food if you're willing to carry the extra weight cooler evenings yep storing your food in the shade right we'll bring well it depends on how the length of the trip but say for a week trip we'll probably bring two or three days worth of full fresh food before it starts to start to get worried about sure. it going bad. Cool. Yeah, I, I I don't do a lot of really early spring trip like tripping. Um, not not because I don't want to. It's uh, just never find the time to for whatever reason. Spring's a busy time for our family, but yeah, it uh, it it's got to happen because I got to get out with Tunis. Tunis is going to show me how to catch a fish. I won't trust him to catch show me how to catch a fish. No, Tunis knows how to catch a brook trout. I I've, I've I've seen his videos and uh, I've never been on a trip with him, but he knows his stuff. <laughs> A little yeah. bit. I just like to be out there. Just a regular guy that likes to fish. Yeah, but you were brought up, I think, uh, trout fishing. I think I, if I, yeah. Yeah. Dad and grandpa, or, uh, grandpa's favorite fish are brook trout. That's a big thing on the East Coast. So that's mm -hmm. the roots. Got, got a great question here. Uh, and this is a, actually a good one that we could, uh, we could send right around the table here. It's from Untamed Ontario, who's always got great questions. We've discussed some of the dangers. The panel mentioned food. What are some of the other advantages of early, early season trips? Mm. That we haven't covered, like it being quiet out and, I don't know, the forest come to life. Again, the days are longer, so you have, like, a summer-like time frame. But, again, colder weather. Oh, are... Yeah, I think too. Like, if you're not a fan of the humidity and and uh, <clears throat> sticky feeling of the of summer heat, then uh, spring's fantastic. If you're like a cozy type of person, right? So you can uh, roll around with a, a sweater on all day long and and feel just fine, as opposed to you know peeling off uh, layers because you're you know sweaty and gross when it's 36 degrees out in uh, in July, yeah. right? So. Yeah. Um, that's no, something to be said for for the spring as well there's um, something to be said too about the type b fun like there's something special about getting soaking wet cold suffering with bugs and then you get like i said wildlife sightings big fish less people again it's nice to sit under a tarp when it's raining i don't know it's, there's lots of different things that are happening in the spring i love that video you did last uh spring uh tunis is uh, when you guys went out to that that spring trip and uh, because what, what what I like about it, which you actually uh, represented in that video, is you can go to places where you can't go in the summer mm -hmm. because the water, in theory, is is higher, right? Yep. So you can get into lakes that you could never even imagine to, to go in mid-August. right? Yep. So I, I like that. Mm -hmm. Chris Maloschek, uh or San, Santa Maloschek says, uh, nicer sleeps in the cool weather. This is very true. Yeah, uh, I tend to sleep better. As long as you're not freezing cold, but uh, I, t I tend to sleep a lot better in the uh, cooler weather. You get that nice, fresh, cool air coming through. Yep. If you like tarping, tarping is a better option when there's no bugs early on. Like, it mm -hmm. saves you five, six pounds. You can sleep under the stars, and, yeah, it's good. Yep. Uh, here's another one from Kim Switzer. If you're a crown land seeker like she is, uh, navigating through the bush before leaves, like before, you know, all the ferns are growing and bushing up, uh, yep. you know, it makes it a lot easier to find uh, trails in some cases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I meant, I mentioned that earlier, just with the vistas still being similar to what they are in the winter, it's far easier to pick your line through the bush than it is when uh, everything's grown in and by, uh, by mid June. So that's uh, a big, a big plus. Sure thing. Uh, Michael saying, uh, best fishing. Brad Archer saying no bugs, right? Uh, I, I always get a kick out of that time of year when the, the, the black flies come out, but they're, like you said, they, they haven't discovered that they're bugs yet or what, their purpose in life, right? Uh, yeah. To get them before they're biting. Flying around, yeah. 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 I, I just, you know what, the other purely, purely commercial and sort of, you know, every, I think a lot of people love gear. And so that first trip of the season is like, Oh boy, I get to test out the gear I got for Christmas. Or I get to test out the gear that I got at the outdoor adventure show that I've been like aching to try. And now I can finally do it with that comes a note of caution. You probably don't want to be peeling the packaging off 
uh, while you're out there to see if it works or not, if it's something that's, you know, uh, crucial to your kit. Uh, but there is something exciting about using a fresh piece of gear for the first time after you've been waiting a long time to use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just love doing the portage where you actually see the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the trilliums, uh, especially the red trilliums come up and then you, uh, you smell the wild leeks coming up. And then you see the um, uh, blue Clintonia coming up and all, all those um, just emerging, right? This is fantastic. And here are the uh, Phoebes and, and uh, um, not the Phoebe that we know, not, not the YouTuber, but the bird uh, just calling off or the, uh, the wren going to the outhouse and hearing um, uh, what are the wrens that nest on the ground? House wren? No, they're not. What's help me out here. What's the wren? That it nests on the ground in the in the springtime, and you hear it chirping away back behind the outhouse. Uh -huh. Oh, anyway, that thing. Come on, you're the bird guy. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I it's got the little tail goes up. Someone help me out here. You talking about a grouse? No, it's a little uh, bird. Uh, it's a thrush. Like a piper type of thing? Or? Not, the, not the wood thrush. What's the little bird? It's a thrush that nests on the ground and calls behind you when you oh, and they, they bob as they walk? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I can't think of the name, but I know what you mean, Kevin. Whipper oh! will. My, my life is gone now. Whipper will? No, it's not the Whipper will. Help me out. No. Woodcock, that's it. No, it's not the Woodcock. It's Big no, Bird. It's not Big, not big <laughs> Bird. Caroline, no, I think, I think Steve's got it. I think Steve's got it. What? Nova Flicker, Carolina Wren, or an American yeah. Wren. No, it's not that. That's a good, good answer, Carolina Wren, but it's not. Wow, oh, what? Oh, is it throwing all the flicker? It's a woodthrush. Woodcocks, peepers. I no. always, hear, I always hear the woodcocks. I okay. It's a lovely bird. I, I know the ones you're talking about. They, 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 they'll, t they'll even uh, nest in like stone driveways and stuff. Yeah. Oh, not yeah, the killer. Yeah, no, not the killer. Not, yeah. kill not the winter wren. Not the Carolina wren. Not the snipe. Oh, what's the bird? What's the bird? Anyway, it's a lovely bird. I love that. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> no, well, we must we're... continue this conversation until we find out the goddamn bird. <laughs> no, a killer? No. No. Anyway, I, a wood thrush. I know the bird you're talking about because I I'm just going to call it wood thrush. I think that's what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Geez. Um, somebody else, uh, like we're going through the uh, different things that uh, that are advantages to uh, paddling in the spring or or backcountry camping because this show's not just geared towards camping because there there are people that uh, like to travel by foot in the backcountry as well. But uh, Evan Lafay was saying white water. Um, let's hope so. Uh, Remy saying cold beers, and of course, Christian Maloschek said ice cold beer. <laughs> These are all important, right? So, yeah, yeah, cool. for sure. Yeah, good point. I mean, uh, Evan's a, Evan's a big whitewater guy, so this is like prime time for him. Um, and uh, and those folks for sure. So, it is the season mm -hmm. for that. Uh, somebody else also mentioned. Oh, right here. Uh, it's uh, Sherry. Sherry mentioned easier on my dog to camp in spring with the cool weather, mm -hmm. and that that brings us into like you know safety with your your pets um, when you get into the back country uh, in the the winter time. Rob, I'll be with you in a minute. Minute there, just so. Ovenbird. 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 <laughs> Hummingbird. No, Ovenbird. Ovenbird. Oven what were we talking about earlier? The bird. Okay, yeah, but. That name doesn't ring a bell for the one I was thinking of. Okay. But, Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, pets. Uh, who, who's got dogs on panel here? I do. They, uh, Kevin does. Nate, you uh, don't have a dog? Well, you got to. a cat. You got a cat. Okay. Got a cat. I got two cats. But you traded a dog. dog in for a cat, Tunis? No. Well, you have to ask Britt about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, Bubba, so Bubba lives with the sister. What what are what are uh, what are some of the factors that we should consider when uh, you know bringing a, a pet back into the backcountry, Kevin? I don't take my dog out on June trips. It, the it, she, uh, she just gets eaten alive. Um, early spring trips, I'll take take her out because I have the bug shelter, and also I don't have anybody to take care of her. 
Um, and she's black too, right? So that attracts um, the the mosquitoes and, and black flies, especially. And they they go up and eat her belly. So I generally by the end of May, early June, I just don't take my dog out. It's not fair to her uh, at all. And then after that, I'm fine. But uh, that's the general rule for early spring trips. I think of her first because unless I had a Malamute or a wolf that can handle that, but my dog can't handle the bugs. Mm -hmm. See, my, my dog, she, she sleeps in my hammock with me, right? But she, uh, if it's cool, oh, she's a bed hog. Like she, she just takes up all the, all the blankets, the whole nine yards, man. She does. She bur she buries herself, and all she'll ha all you'll see is her little brown nose sticking out, <laughs> right? But I, I I don't mind taking the dog out in cooler or fair or fair, or fair weather. Uh, just like you, Kevin, I don't really like taking her on them trips where bugs are going to be an issue because she's just miserable. You know, her poor belly gets eaten up. You know, all around the backside, her nose. Um, yeah, any place that she can't she can't protect, right? I used to love bringing Bubba out in the early spring. I would just say that if you have uh, if you haven't tried your dog in a boat, make sure you try it before because cold water isn't the best time to see if your dog's skittish or going to jump out or tip you over. But mm -hmm. it's great to have them out when there's no bugs and it's cold for them. Yeah, and you have to remember too they they like their comforts. They may need to eat a little more because it is cool. Um, you know, having uh, having something warm for them to lay on on the ground when you're around a campfire is yeah. is pretty key. I've got a uh, um, what do you call it? a wax canvas? Uh, just it's like, it's like 36 by 24 or something like that, and it's uh, it's got wool on one side, wax canvas on the other, so it repels moisture and it blocks just some of the the cool air from coming mm -hmm. up under the ground, right? From underneath. Close off foam works great too. Yeah. Yeah, when I would uh, when I would bring Moose out, he always knew when that when that closed cell foam mat came out, that's where he was supposed to lay. And then uh, usually, what I'd do is if the bugs got too bad for him, he would be more than happy to just hang out in the tent, and he just liked feeling the breeze and and uh, being out there with me. So I would just let him into the tent, make sure he wasn't going to put a hole in my sleeping pad, and he'd be fine there until you know he wanted to come out for whatever reason. So. Uh, if we were just hanging out at the campsite, uh, he was more than happy with that. There is someone asking about repellents for dogs, and th that's a really good question. Uh, they're not perfect. But you can't put DEET on the dog. The dog will lick his fur, and then that's not good for it. Citronella probably uh, over time is not good for it. But I asked my vet, and I made one out of um, cinnamon stick, uh, vanilla extract, mm -hmm. and and lemon l lemon extract. And it, it works. It's not 100% though, but it, it works better than, than all the others. So go to your vet and say, I want to take my dog out in the spring because I have to. What can I use? I've heard tea tree oil works well too. It, it does. You just have to wash the, the, the dogs out licking. Like what the problem, if you put that on the dog, the dog's not going to want it there. So it's going to be licking away, right? So yeah. crazy. Crazy. We got a guest in the basement here uh, that wants to come up and ask a question or a comment or two. Let's bring uh, Rob up from uh, Rob and the outside. Rob, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? Oh, doing okay. Doing okay. Right on. Hi, guys. Um, I just want to touch. Kevin, you brought up a really good point when you made that comment. Hi, puppy. When you made that comment, oh, look, there's a hill there. Now, Sabrina and I had been river running for two years, doing little kind of camp trips all in like in central Ontario. And then last year I decided I'm going to do my Algonquin trip and I planned it. And Sabrina was going like, look at that portage. Like that's like two is, and a half. Is this the one you dislocated your shoulder on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I planned that going, you know, 23 days, 453 kilometers. I, I can nail that. That's not a problem. Then I get there and I'm like, Oh crap. Now I remember why they call it the highlands. Like I just, I completely didn't. And I never even thought about looking at a topo map or anything like that. So now when I'm planning my trips, I am, I've got my eye hunter and I got other things. So my question is for the people who don't know off, like a lot of people know where to go and look at a map and dry out a nice little flat line to plan their trips. What are the resources where they can go find topo maps to plan their trips? So they don't run into situations where they're like, Oh, I got 300 pounds of gear 
and I'm going uphill for two kilometers. <laughs> Yeah, like so, I, I you know obviously for Algonquin, uh, the new Jeff Jess Maps yeah. by Jeff Jess by Maps. Who is that man? Now, what do we call him? Ma Maps. Maps by Jeff. Yes, you can actually know the elevation. But for other than that, a topo map, I, I think it's really important for you guys to know. So for topo lines, the reason why, yeah, there you go. Um, a topographical map is one you can get where I get my sources. Well, I'm lucky at the college. I, I teach all the maps for, for all of Canada are in the library. So I get to photocopy them. Oh, everybody just email Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> and also they have a laminator as well. I, I got it. I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm part-time. I make no money there, but I got this. I got this. So, um, but you can go to um, uh, World of Maps in Ottawa. And on their website, and they're the best source uh, to get topo maps. So when you look at the topographical maps, the squiggly lines, uh, that's why they call it topographical maps. They're always squiggly lines. If you look at the base of the map, it will say the distance between those topo squiggly lines, right? Ooh, sorry, like this. And some maps will have 10 meters. Some will be 20. I think this map has 10. That means those topo lines are 10 meters apart in elevation. So you might like saying, well, Kevin, if some of the top of lines are wide apart and some are really close. So what does that mean? Well, if they're only 10 meters apart, that means the elevation, if they're close apart, is high up. So the squeezing so the brown squiggly lines are, the more you're going uphill. So if, if you're following a route and you sort of see all these lines compact, you're going you're, you're gonna to be working. Also, is how did they ever figure that out? Going back in the day when they didn't have this, they were explorers, they're First Nations people. How did they know where to portage? It was the valley of the land, right? How they looked at it and well, well, that looks like it's easier to walk through instead of going up there, going up there. They went through the valley of the land, and that's how you can figure out what top of maps. When you're doing a river, it's really important to note too. If you see the top of the lines cross the river, that's a waterfall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so watch where you're going. And also the top of lines will go into a V. That means the river flows into the V. So you know where the di you know where the direction of the river uh, as well. And it's it's also also called bush time. Like there's so many old lost portages I found by just looking at it. I go where where would I go? Well, I'm not going to go up there. I'm going to go over there. So um, yeah. The, also the grid lines too is really important for you guys to know on top of lines. The grid lines uh, are these UTM coordinates. They're, they're not longitude and latitude. They're actually grid lines that were created uh, by the military during um, the Cold War to make it more better to blow things up. But <laughs> everything is longitude and latitude. But every every uh, every um, um, uh, topographical map, no matter the scale, these grid patterns are a thousand meters apart, right? So that's a kilometer. So you know your distance as well. And if you're looking at the distance, you know that actually the average person on a portage, a good portage with a pack on or a canoe on, can actually go um, uh, one kilometer every 20 minutes. So that's how you can judge the distance and when you're going to be finished or, or time. It, it, like in the old days, you could have these beads on you and count the beads and, how, and your pacing because the average person goes 1.5 meters per pace. But you're not going to do that in the bush. You're not going to count your paces, right? And in the old days when I worked in forestry, we'd, ha we'd have to have these beads. Well, now you have the friggin' Apple Watch. It just tells you when you're going to be there. But if you didn't do it time-wise, if you're going um, 20 minutes per uh, per kilometer. Yeah, so if you don't have Jess maps or maps by Jess, uh, uh, look at the contour lines. The other thing on contour lines, they'll have a given – Height. So let's uh, every now and then there'll, there'll be a number on those contour lines, like 360, right? And that that's a given elevation they're giving you, with not for every single elevation, but if you're you're looking at 360 and then there's two or three more contour lines above that, we'll just add 10 meters from that, and you know the highest point of land because you just add them. All right. Sorry, I went off tangent. No, that's good. That's good. Oh, that's educational. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had another question, and it was about puppies, because um, I'm bringing her out with me this year. But you guys already answered that. Like, I know I didn't want to take her out right. I'm not going to get her out early in the spring because Josh and I are going to be hitting creeks, and I don't think that's fair to her to be standing around while we're fly fishing. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask when would be the better time to get them out, but you've already said after June. So that kind of answers that question. 
it's it, it, this is my personal view. It's just not fair. Like you can you can actually put a bug jacket on that dog, and the dog will look at you like take this thing off. It's like wearing yeah. a freaking Christmas outfit. Yeah, we've we've actually we've got her in a harness right now, and I'm trying to get her used to wearing the harness and like a life jacket as well. Um, she was she's a November pup, so it's funny she doesn't even like getting her feet wet right now. So. But she loves sitting That's in the canoe. Not gonna cut her for a black lab, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But she loves sitting in the canoe out in the lawn right now, and I've been rocking the crap out of it while she's been in it, and she's been happy sitting in it. So we'll see what happens when she gets on the water, right? The baby? biggest thing you should ever do for that dog, though, at that age, is actually um, um, put a, a mat and even glue it in the canoe. You don't have to glue it, but I glue a mat in, and and teach it to go to the mat. So when the the, the wind gets bad and it's in big waves, go to your mat. And the dog dogs always want to be told what to do. It's a it, it's a pack order, right? Yeah. And, and you're the head of the pack. Oh, okay. I'll go to the mat. Or when you're doing rapids, right? yeah, never go to your that. mat, and they will go to the mat. And of course, instead of the dog like, Whoa! um, right. And so my my dogs have border collies, so it really needs to be told what to do. It's it's a working animal, right? And so uh, also on the portages, it carries its own pack don't carry its food it wants to work so when yeah. it will go across and then woohoo and then because it's black too make sure that it has a vest on and bells on because it's going to look like a black bear walking up to someone on the portage they're going to yeah yeah we've already got a few bells for her and stuff so yeah. so at the end of the portage give it a treat and also an umbrella um get a dollar store umbrella and mount it to the gunnel because you're going across a big lake when it's really sunny and you think the dog's fine because it's a dog. The dog can handle anything. No, it's going to get sunstroke. Sunstroke. So, uh, so go to the mat and, and then have that. an umbrella over the mat. Yeah, thank you for that. I never even thought about that. And the mat's mm -hmm. a really great idea too. Thank you. And then, and and then when I go out, I have a mat. People say, Kevin, go to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but that was it, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. It's great seeing all you guys. Thanks, Rob. Yes, you, Rob. Popping up. Tell everybody how easy it is to pop on panel and ask a question. Very easy. Just click that link and wait for Dennis to pull you up and have a chaga or a tea or whatever you there got. You go. You're that people. <laughs> Rob says join us on panel. Thanks, Rob. Absolutely. We'll talk to you later, man. Hey, thanks, Rob. guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, another good question here just come up from uh, Tim at uh, Super Good Camping. Are there resources to find water levels for whatever river or lake you're planning to paddle? And this could really come into play for the spring season. Um, <clears throat> there are some on the MNRF page where they have a list of dams with hydrometers, I believe is the term, and it'll measure the water flow through that structure in cubic feet per, uh, what is it, Kevin? Cubic feet per second? Yeah, it is still feet on their website. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe some oh. of the channels, but yeah, the, it's not it's not perfect information. Um, you need comparables to in order to see whether it's running high or running low or medium flow. Uh, but it will. There are a number of stations that will give you a rating along with a graph to let you know some historical data going back for the last you know couple weeks month um and it can be a good indicator of where the level's at now what you would really need if you're using it for planning purposes is where that level was at for the same time last year so you know sort of what you're looking at that's a really good wet, wet website to know so conservation authorities have it more detailed than the mnr the mnr is one okay. hard to find my my lock is one of our uh, canoe buddies doug that's his job for the MNR is to know the water levels all over Ontario. So we just, Hey Doug. Um, but he gets it off the website. So when you find that website, uh, I'll send it to Dennis. I know it exists and it will show you that that day or every couple of days when, where the water level is. However, it's dam controlled. So you never know when they're going to open that dam or not. So mm -hmm. you, you might think the water level is good and then get there and they might decide to miss soggy river up by Algoma is, is notorious for that. They open it up every couple of hours. So you might think you have lots of water and then you're walking it. So when, when you, when you, Nate, you say it's measured by cubic feet per minute, perhaps 
how how does that relate to the water level? Like how how do you know is that a lot of water going through? Is that uh, is that is that sufficient for the river? If you've never been to that particular area, how how, right. how do you how do you relate those two together? Well, basically, the faster the the faster the water is moving through the meter, the generally speaking, the higher it's going to be because it's push 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 pushing, and as it push push pushes, it goes up up up. Um, right. And I just found the website. You can actually search it on a map. Uh, hang on, I'll drop it into the chat. Now, this is the, the Government of Canada one. I don't think it's the one you were referring to, Kevin, but um, each of the dams is is uh, marked. Well, some there. dams are federal, too, not provincial. So, yeah. So, yeah, like this, the is federal, this is the federal one. Uh, but it gives you some really good um like for instance it gives you a number of the ones around algonquin the other thing i've done that's a lot quicker phone an outfitter and they'll look out their window and tell you <laughs> yeah that's true. yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah like i can already tell you the water coming out of the big east river which comes out of the park is low for the time of year it just is so okay cool uh, let's see. We got another guest here in the basement. Uh, another regular guest up onto the panel. There we got Donald Dakota. Let's there. hope we don't get any echo and feedback from you tonight, Donald. <laughs> yeah, that'd be <laughs> good. That would be good not to have that. So it's nice to yeah. see all you guys on the little TV thing here again. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, spring tripping. Um, everything you guys talked about, uh, especially what Tuna said. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's the best time to be out. Love being out. Um, but a thought I had, it, I've seen a lot of people writing about the cold water and dry suits and wet suits and all that kind of stuff. Some people might want to try if they're, if they're skeptical or maybe even a little bit afraid of the cold. As soon as those lakes clear up anywhere near where you live, as soon as that ice goes out, take a couple friends, take your boat out, have a rope going to shore with your friends up on shore. You go out fully clothed in all your warm gear and flip that boat over. You've got someone there to rescue your butt and get you warm right away, but it's going to teach you the shock of that ice water and just how, it, if you haven't gone through the ice, you don't know. But if you've gone through the ice, and then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So if people want to know what that risk is really like, just go and do that, but with in a safe, you know, in a safe situation with, uh, with some friends and that, and then that's you're not really prepared but you know you got a good idea what's going to happen should you go in the water and which you shouldn't because the weather should always be making your call always and donald um I, I go to, oh whoa is that me i don't know no, it's donald it's donald i gotta put you on mute don uh, Donald, uh, uh, sorry, I'm telling too many stories, but this is important uh, the story to tell. So I'm in a Gonquin park years ago with a bunch of guys uh, that I went through high school with. And my canoe partner was sort of like, yeah, whatever. I know what I'm doing, you know, and, uh, whatever. And so we got uh, windbound on Manitou Lake and we had to be out that day. And it was massive winds. It was early, early May. And uh, we all decided to stop and wait to, for the wind. And these canoes went by us and my partner canoe partner goes, those guys are doing it. Oh, okay. Whatever. Like I'm not doing it. You can do whatever you want, but it's my boat. So you can walk then because I'm not going anywhere until this calms down. And then he insists. Right. And I finally said to myself, it's time to learn. We went out and I flipped the boat. Just like you said, I actually flipped the boat on purpose and, and soaked him to bone to the bone. Right now we're at the site. So he's able to get to shore. I looked at him and went, that's why we're not going. How cold are you right now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, but to be going out, that was the last canoe trip I ever did with that guy. And that and that makes sense. Uh, uh, one of my son's earliest trips when he was little, we were camped on an island uh, in the Boundary Waters, and a big storm came. It, was, it turned into winter in the spring, and it was sideways. You know, you couldn't think the trees could bend that much. And I taught him right there. I said, you go out in that. I don't care what your, you think your schedule is. You go out there today, you will die. I said, you're going to get swamped and you'll never make it to shore to get a fire going or anything. You'll die. So that's teaching a kid young. You, you just, the weather makes the call. Same with Lake Superior, paddling all year on Lake Superior. That lake makes the 
fall. So it's the same thing in the spring. It's uh, you know, you get these marathon guys that are in a big hurry, and oh, I've got to be out on the eighth because the ninth I got to go to work. Uh, BS. Um, you'll come out when the weather permits you to safely come out. And people on the outside just have to learn to accept that and uh, and deal with it. It's just mindset, though, too, because um, uh, a quick one, too, is like, I remember Andy and I be on a, a really a one month canoe trip and we're on our last night of the trip in Quetico. And in theory, we could have paddled across to get to the car after 28 days. Uh, but our mindset was we're not in a hurry and it's way too windy. Another canoe group had just started and imagine their excitement. Imagine their excitement. We finally are here. Woo! -hoo! And they headed out into the wind and they flipped and we had to go out and do a rescue. And so the whole thing was is that it had nothing to do with I didn't I'm not knocking them at all. I, I would have the same mindset. Well, we can do this. Woo! -hoo! We're all excited to be out like the spring. But we were out for a month and our mindset was totally different. We weren't in a hurry. We we're being smarter, right? Yeah, exactly. Right on. So, yeah, I saw Kevin had something for having three more people come up. So that's why I popped in here and throw a little information out there. Say hello to you guys. So that kind of good stuff. They sure missed a new copia this year. Yeah, oh, I would have loved to have been there, but we, we couldn't because uh, we had did the previous week at um, at the Quiet Adventure Symposium down there. Oh, so, so. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife was saying something funny about that just now, but uh, we went to we went to Quiet Adventures to see Kevin. And there you go. Oh, and Hap and Christina and everybody. So that was a good show. Yeah, that was a good show. Yeah, that was that was a very good yeah, time. Really and, uh, and uh, but uh, kind of missed. Kind of miss not going to Canoe Copia. That would have been great. So probably next year. We'll see. And next year I'm doing the other one. So. <laughs> so well, then we'll do the one you're at. Hey, we'll do the one you're at and we'll, we'll go get a bite to eat or something. And that would be kind of fun. For sure. For sure. Thanks, Donald. Appreciate you popping on the panel there. We'll talk to you a little later. Sounds good. We'll see you. Cheers. Take Bye -bye. care. Um, <clears throat> where's my butt? Yeah, we'll <laughs> – There we go. I will say too that um, like when I'm when I do my first little crown outing of the season and I'm by myself, I always choose I'm not crossing any big water, right? So it's it's know your limits, stay within yeah. it. Not doing any silly big water crossing, not doing any you know uh, no white water stuff, right? Um, and uh, when I'm by myself for that first trip of the season, it's a nice quiet small lake with maybe a couple portages at the most. And uh, really, it's just for me to get out there and enjoy enjoy the springtime. Yeah, for those who haven't been to Algonquin, right? Like you're saying, Cedar, Kios, Opiongo, they're all they're no joke, right? Yeah. It takes a second, and the water changes. So, yeah, sure. Opiongo, like look at the history of the drownings in on the, in the springtime in Opiongo. It, it's terrifying. Yeah. Let's, let, let's talk a little bit about that. The, Kevin, you, you brought up just a minute ago there about uh, having to do a, a, a rescue, right? It, I'd be curious to know how many people in the chat actually have experience or know how to perform a, a canoe over canoe rescue or, or something along that lines, because it's such an important skill to know and learn, right? Uh, whether somebody's rescuing you or you're rescuing somebody. Uh, well, I'll throw, I'll throw this to Tunis, but I, I, I got to say that actually, you don't want to do it. Like I, I, I teach students how to do that, and I, I basically tell them, you don't want to do this in a major storm. You want to go to shore and float yeah. to shore, even though I, you know that's not what I'm supposed to tell them. <laughs> you try to do a two over yeah. two rescue in a major windstorm in the middle of Obiongo. Good luck to you. Yeah, I was gonna say mm -hmm. to be honest, I have no experience with that. Right, I'm always picking up the guy on shore, so. <laughs> yeah now tunis would you be comfortable t telling us about like you you you're an emt yep and is that that's right emt right yeah uh, we call them paramax in ontario but paramax. sure oh, yeah. okay whatever walleye pickerel God, no. taxi <laughs> driver it's all, it's all the same but let, let's talk about uh the the effects of hypothermia and the best measures to take if you do have if you do dump like from your from your standpoint, what's what's the best things to do to get yourself warm and safe again? Sure. So the best step is to prevent it would be number one. But if you do find yourself in a hypothermic state, are you to get with someone? Are you alone? Is the next question, right? Because like, are we are you asking me how to get warm if you were to dump your canoe or just in general? Well, okay. Well, 
but yeah, just in general, just. So obviously hypothermia is reduction in body temperature. So like you said earlier, to get away moisture, the cold. So wiping yourself off, air drying, whatever the case would be, new set of clothes. Um, I'm going to say warmer fluids would be the easiest way to do it because like we've all had it where you've put on a hoodie and stuff, but you're still chilled to the bone, right? So the only way to really correct your core would be to start slamming some tea, hot water, all that kind of stuff. And, um, I mean, so if you, if you're canoeing with a friend and, and some, and you dump and your, your buddy is in a hypothermic state, what, what can you do for the person that's in a hypothermic state? Well, all the same things, right? You'll be doing the workload for them, but it all comes down to getting out of the elements and then removing the fact the risk factors so removing again the hazard itself which would be the moisture water whatever wind again robs you of that um conduction Mm -hmm. start to fire again but like are we saying that you have like your gear do you have no gear like did you get your your full pack like there's so many variables with that because again like i'm not a survivalist right so if we're gonna go the whole what should you do first thing right there's probably way more qualified people in that area but um the one thing i, I like you didn't add in there is please do not spoon with kevin callen right <laughs> i mean <laughs> hey, hey tuna so i'll give you a case scenario to see what you would do because you're the expert with this right so years ago uh, i was doing a trip down the miss Navi river i was solo and i was on miss Navi lake and actually the um, the MNR had a tugboat there at the time and they're tugging this motorboat um, across and it was sinking. So I'm on the solo trip. I was like freaking 23 years old, right? So all of a sudden the tugboat driver w- waves at me um, and because his tugboat had run out of gas. So the boat he's tu- tugging is sinking. The owner is on the, uh, the, mo- the, the uh, motorboat and he goes, Hey, can you get the guy out of the water and I'll get the boat out of the water? I went, okay, because he's trying to exchange gas. So I went to get him. Imagine this. I'm a, I'm on a solo trip I'm, I'm towards James Bay. And this guy I approach, and you would have endless stories about this than I would ever. But imagine this guy. He's inebriated. He's looking for his smokes. His boat's sinking to the bottom. And he's grabbing for my canoe. And I'm in the middle of Miss Navi Lake. I got my paddle and I whacked him in the head. I was just going to say smack him. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah. I feel much better about myself. <laughs> well, because you're no good if you go over too, right? He no. grabs you, you're done. Yeah. So I did the right thing. Okay, now what I did do after that is I threw him the rope and I dragged, I, I literally dragged him to shore. Yep. I was going to give him my PFD and that would be wrong, right? I mean, I wouldn't give it to him. No, it's up to you. you think that'd be because, like I said, you're you're now making two patients, right? If you put yourself susceptible to this, right? He's already at risk or drowning, whatever the case is. If you start to give away your stuff, right, you're putting yourself in the harm's way as well, right? Now you got two people to worry about. So, okay, I don't know. I think you did the right thing given the the circumstances, right? All this stuff is circumstantial, right? There's no there's SOPs or certain procedures for things, but at the end of the day, right? Like every emergency and stuff's different. And sometimes it takes some, some uh, creativity, I guess, to figure it out. It's, it's almost like the schoolyard. I reacted. Now, if it was Nate, I would smack him twice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No, no, I'm just joking. Nate. I'm just... You have a comment for that? Nate. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was interesting about You're that? Making a hard smack, right? Nick? <laughs> <laughs> is I, I always felt bad about that, and I'm glad you actually helped out with that because I I thought maybe I shouldn't have done that, but that was no because stress crazy. makes people do crazy things, right? And it also, if you're an anxious person to begin with, right, then it's even more compounded, right? Because like you don't know how you're going to react until you're in an emergency, right? You can sit there and say you're going to be this cool hot shot dude when you get an axe in your foot or your hand or whatever right but until you have it happen you have no idea right you could be passing out screaming or flailing around whatever right so like 
Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes left in the show here, and I have a bunch of questions that are actually starred here from quite a ways back that maybe we could do a quick little uh, quick answer type of session here. First one here was, uh, and this is going to be an interesting one here, a uh, question from Canoe and Paddle. What do you guys do to get back into trip shape? Kevin? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Tell, ask the old guy. I'm going around in a circle, man. <laughs> uh, I go on a trip, and then I get in shape after a couple of weeks, and I die for the first two weeks. And <laughs> Yeah, I, I, especially this winter. I only winter camp twice. That's usually – I. My my job has me driving all the time. Like I literally drive all the time. That's all I do. So I'm really out of shape. COVID really did me in. I'm old, whatever. Uh, but I'll do my spring trip, and halfway through the trip, I'm fine. The next trip, I'll get better in shape by midsummer. I'm good. So that's not the answer. I mean, these guys will give you a better answer than I. I was gonna say, stay in shape all year. That's the answer. Because movement is the fountain of youth, Kevin. Don't forget that. Every nine year old. Every nine-year-old I've picked up who's in phenomenal shape has said the same thing. I found something I loved and I didn't stop. So Yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah. The thing is, too, is with tripping, right? Like uh, Rob was saying, when you have 200 pounds of gear or whatever, maybe slightly over-exaggerating, but you're setting yourself up for injury. You're walking on unstable surfaces, wet, whatever. And, right, we've all had tweaks. You sit there and you push a little too hard. Next, you know, your hip hurts or your back, whatever the case is. Well, to prevent that, right, is to be in shape, stretch, all that kind of stuff, right? Obviously, you're not doing like a full routine before you start the portage and stuff unless you're really hardcore. But if you come with a baseline of fitness, you're just setting yourself up for success. Plus, you're going to probably move quicker and feel better the entire trip, right? Your recovery is going to be quicker and, I don't know. Yeah. Like, Less gears, so more water. <laughs> Wait, so so how do you, how do you deal with this at, at my age though too? Is like my, my problem is I make most of my money through the through through the winter by doing my other job. So all of a sudden yeah. my spring trip's coming up. Yeah. Well, yes, I should be doing those stretches. And and in my youth, I was able to balance on rocks like no tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Like, uh, so how, what would you say to to someone that would say, okay, well, I love to do what you're saying, but I don't have the time right. to do it. First off, it just comes down to a little self-discipline. And like we all have, like as much as we want to say we don't have time in a day for ourselves, you make time for yourself, right? It's how bad do you want that? So like we can all wake up a half hour earlier or instead of scrolling on your phone 15 minutes, four times a day, you could, you know, somehow set in that 20 minutes. And then like I said, YouTube is a phenomenal resource, especially now with like the quick short form content. There's guys like Squat University, and Athlean X, they're both uh, – one's a physiotherapist, the other guy, I'm not sure what his background is, but they're both super smart, know the body. If you have any aches or pains or any underlying other injuries, like these guys will help you like rebuild your body. So like they have lots of shorts where you can just like flick through for stretches, certain body movements, and you don't have to be a bodybuilder or anything, right? They're meant for people who want to just better themselves. So Cool. I don't know. Like I said, it's just a matter how bad do you want it, right? Like we all say we don't have time, but you make time for yourself. Like you are your own person. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Nathan's got a good point. Do a workout while watching this show. There you go. Right. Yeah. Treadmill in front of your television or your yeah. computer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what I do? I, I portage my grandson every time I see him. <laughs> I don't give him piggyback rides. I, I go, come on, Papa's gonna portage you, and up he goes on the shoulders, and that's like, oh, that's a little bit of a workout, right? Yeah. Kid's getting bigger, he's getting heavier. Yeah, walk the dog. Yeah, right. yeah, my dog. Saves, yeah, my dog saves me for sure because I, I, I get home and the dog has to go out. So, yeah, how about you, Nate? Do you have a regiment for uh, staying in shape uh, for the spring or? Well, as a matter of fact, I just uh, just hired Tunis as my uh, personal virtual <laughs> trainer and, uh, and motivate motivational life coach. Um, and uh, I got you, buddy. I'll start sending you some uh, some programs after the show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, I got to get on that um, because uh, I went from having a fairly active job to sort of a desk job and and uh, and a kid. So. Um, my my daughter is like a pound and a half away from being able to fit in uh, the Osprey pack, and as soon as that happens, it's game on. So, um, portaging the kid, right? That's yeah, right. Yeah, but uh, 
I will say one of the things that I used to do very often that I'd like to get back to the habit of is lap swimming. Yep. Yep. So for all, time, all kinds of all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Cool. Actually, I, I melt off the pounds in the spring by mountain biking. Hey, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That uh, gets the cardio going too. So no huffing and puffing on the trail. Uh, I believe this is from Brittany asking, do you worry about bears more in the spring than the summer and the fall? Is there a big difference? Kevin? Put the, you put the pressure on <laughs> Um Okay. Well, hey, I, I heard your bear debate. You were, uh, he, he did a presentation with oh. a bunch of other panelists at Canucopia. And, uh, it, that was brutal. I, I was asked the last minute to fill in. And everybody was terrified. During that presentation about bears, I was like, "Chill, everybody, just chill. Uh, if, if they if they attack, it, it'll go quick. You won't feel it." <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, okay, yeah. So there is some new stuff this year that you should worry about for bears. They're coming out early because of uh, the early spring, so they're going to be hungry and they're not getting the food that they would get when they wake up, and they haven't fed. So again, they don't truly hibernate; they deep sleep, and the mother. Um, has is awake the entire winter with the, the babies, um, uh, the cubs uh, on their teats, right? And you know when that happens, with, they do a, um, a plug in their butt uh, for poop. So they don't poop all, all winter. And when they come out, so you see this big, huge bear poop everywhere, they're out of the den. That's how you know they're out of the den. And so, yeah, so in theory, they will come out and they'll start browsing on uh, grass and new gross whatever but now there's nothing and they're coming out so i would worry a little bit now uh because they're hungry in the fall is supposedly in theory they're more dangerous um because they're going to den up and they need to eat as much possible before they actually go into that slow time so they're going to, be go going to be looking for as much nutrients as possible with that said though i did look at the studies of algonquin the male boars that are known to be predaceous bears, which is a really rare thing to happen, but in the history of Algonquin, when a bear has killed someone or more than one person, it was a predaceous bear eating a person to consume it for fat consumption in the end of the year. So those boars, when they tagged them, they found out that those bears leave Algonquin to go to other areas in search of other foods. Um you're done. Don't go out. Don't go camping. You're done. Don't even try. Kevin, it's you good. mentioned the bears unplugging. Uh, I got I got one of my four four day Algonquin Park solo canoe trips. That the video, it's a two part video. I was at a campsite and obviously a bear had unplugged there because there was bear. It, it, it was like just an explosion of crap everywhere no that was me dennis i i was at that no. site before you i had to you go. better get that checked kevin <laughs> <laughs> I, with herbaceous bears though which is what everybody well the majority of people are going to deal with herbaceous bears are when they get used to going to the campsite that doesn't happen until july august when they wake up they're not herbaceous yet they're like just roaming around looking for food it's when they're going to come into your camp because they're used to getting food because they did that last year that doesn't happen until uh, the summer happens. Cool. Interesting. Okay, so uh, David from uh, North here is asking, he's planning his first ever Algonquin Park spring canoe trip. In a normal spring, how bad or muddy are the portages? Get ready to get wet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny. You, th you think it wouldn't be that bad, right? Because the, the portages are fairly well maintained you know they they usually put the runners like runner logs and stuff like that when you're what? close to the entrances maybe but when you go to any uh a little deeper or i said low yeah. lying there's uh more than a fair share of places to get wet yeah, so dennis we'll, we'll talk to nate because he works for ontario parks now he'll get on a call to actually make sure that all the portages in the golf are paved now so yeah. you don't have to deal with this issue Oh, not paved. I'm going to make it, it'll be nice and mulchy with like some hard grade wood chips on the top just to make it comfortable for everybody. Let's make sure it's cedar. <laughs> cool. So I think that would uh, just about close up the show. Uh, just for those of you in the chat, I had a uh, question in the chat there asking how, or have you started to plan a spring backcountry trip? And out of 148 votes, we had 
percent of the people in the chat saying yes they are planning a trip so good for you uh for the other 33 percent maybe you should consider it uh get yourself out there get get out there enjoy uh the nice weather uh the cool weather the uh the bug free uh you know just stay warm out there stay warm and dry and you should have a blast uh any final closing statements there kevin Yes, two things really quickly. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., uh, my Happy Camper Pack goes uh, for sale, and the monies uh, goes to Camp Outlook to get youth. Um, we don't call them youth at risk anymore. Youth that can't get out on a cruise ship for various reasons goes to that. Ten. So get your laptops out. The other, you know what? I I, I don't. I stacked a whole pile of books out uh, here to show you how to plan a spring trip and. It's just, I, can't, I don't have time. We'll have to, have to talk about, how are you, Tunis? You got anything uh, to close with? Uh, advice? No, if you haven't been out there, and if you are going out there, be safe and have a lot of fun. Like I said, it's a great time. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And neat. Yeah, plan for something, even if it's just a quick overnight, just to get your toes wet and even more stoked for the season. Um, plan and then plan some more. Um, and, uh, if you pack a little heavy because you're packing extra layers and extra food, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh, be safe out there. If anyone's looking for uh, an alternative to watching a whole pile of uh, spring trout YouTube videos, um, The Singing Wilderness by Sigurd Olson has a fantastic few chapters on uh, spring and getting out there in the spring that, I'll, that will get you extra stoked beyond the YouTube videos that you're currently watching. So if you're a reader, check that one out for sure. Perfect. Perfect. And you know what? I, I, I'm just going to add this. And I, I love what Tunis said earlier. He says, know your limits and play within it type of thing. Right. Uh, and it goes right with what Nate just said. You know, it could be an overnighter. Heck, it could be an afternoon or it could be just a day outing. Get out there, enjoy it, but be prepared for it. Uh, if you do go out for a day outing, still pack yourself a little ditch kit. Uh, something that might fit in a hip sack or, you know, sort of like a, what do they call those? Across, comes across like a bivy type of thing or what are they called uh a rucksack a little rucksack whatever but you know what get out there be prepared uh practice your skills uh you know practice building a fire uh getting yourself warm if you can't do it dry you're not going to do it wet right so uh let's learn how to do that anyways gentlemen thanks very much uh for sharing some knowledge and tips and advice and all the stuff that goes along with that uh, I think it was a pretty good show. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Dennis. Yeah. Thanks very much, Dennis. And, and now also, I have my personal trainer. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Let's take a dip, Kevin. Anyways, uh, you know what? There are a couple of other uh, past episodes on spring trip planning uh, that in my uh, video library. Please do go check them out because the information gathered there never never gets old. Uh, it's uh it's all proven. It's all tried and true. And we have different guests on past episodes that uh, also shared their knowledge with us too. So by all means, please do check that out. Gents, I'm going to drop you into the basement as I close up the show here. We'll see you in a few short moments. Thanks again. Yeah. Awesome. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that and uh, got a little thing, a little bit out of it. Uh, to those of you that popped on panel to uh, share uh, a little knowledge or ask some questions, thanks very much for that. That, uh, that was really good. Just wanted to remind everybody, next week uh, we are doing a show on the Allure Paddling in the Yukon. So uh, we got a few great panelists for that as well. So you want to make sure you tune in. And uh, you know what? Enjoy what's left of this winter because the soft water season is almost upon us. Anyways, everybody, have yourselves a great week. We will talk to you soon. And remember, please do keep the adventures alive. Until next time.